is a historian of many skills, both in terms of chronological period. His main research interest is 20th century Southeastern Europe. He started his career by going to Bulgaria and Macedonia and devoted a great number of articles, books to the Macedonian problem and the Macedonian-Bulgarian relations. Uh, but he's quite exceptional in the sense that uh, then in connection with his habilitation, he stepped back to the 17th century, uh, so chronologically he stepped back, and also moved toward the north. So he's not only a specialist of uh, southeastern Europe, but also of northeastern Europe, Swedish-Russian relations. But he is also many-sided in terms of approaches. So he is uh, an intellectual historian, a political historian, a social historian, and uh, to a very great extent also what I could call a public intellectual. So for him, the past is uh, an integral part, so to say, of the present. So one of his major research fields is the politics of memory. And uh, to describe his character, he is also one of those historians, there are not so many of them, who enjoys what he's doing. And he, he shows that he enjoys what he's doing. He's wholeheartedly interested in all the topics that he's dealing with. And he is also a very popular professor in Leipzig. So this is his main job, being a professor at the University of Leipzig and deputy director of uh, GVZ2, a major institute of uh, research into the history of Eastern Europe in Germany. It was just this January that uh, we commemorated, we celebrated his 65th birthday, and on this occasion, a bibliography of his works uh, was also published, and only the bibliography is 140 pages. So he is uh, a very prolific uh, uh, author and he also goes to many, many places. To give one example of his special interest is also the history of Armenians and the role of Armenians played in the history of Eastern and Central Europe. So he, is, uh, he follows that uh, path in the history of German historical scholarship that fully integrates the history of our region into the history of Europe. And this is also uh, the topic of his presentation today, because now he, for a while, he has been dealing with the problems of international law, more precisely, the Eastern European imprint on international law, which I think is a pretty much neglected field. So. Professor Trust, it's not the floor, but the screen now that is yours. Thank you very much for um, uh, the kind introduction and for the invitation to Kösset. This is, I think, the third time that I have the privilege to speak to you. This time on a topic which emerged out of a research project at the Leibniz Institute for the History and Culture of Eastern Europe, Gebitz et O in Leipzig. The project so far has resulted in two PhD theses and two habilitation theses, all to be published as monographs. Currently, we are working on an encyclopedic publication entitled International Law and History, Eastern Europe in a Global Perspective. Let me begin with a quotation from Stefan And I quote him, the history of international law is too important, not to say too interesting, to leave it as the property of a professional elite. Moreover, that professional elite has been scandalously negligent for too long in exploring its history, unquote. In other words, the history of international law its theoreticians and practitioners 
should no longer be left to experts on international law, that is international lawyers and jurists, but should also be the object of research by professional historians. That is exactly what we started to do in Leipzig. For quite some time now, historians are confronted with a significant paradigm shift in their trade. In the 19th century, historical discipline focused predominantly on the state. And while 20th century his historians were predominantly captivated with society, for 21st century historians, a key disciplinary shift has taken place towards memory. This shift was triggered not the least by the global caesura of 1989, which saw democratization in Eastern Europe and parts of Eurasia and a new focus on dictatorial pasts in Southern Europe, Latin America, South Africa. Not coincidentally, the journal History and Memory, published by Indiana University Press in Bloomington, was founded in 1989. This means that historians continue, of course, to look into the past, to go to archives, to decide, decipher ego documents and to interview contemporary witnesses. Yet, in addition, they also analyze present day cultures of remembrance and occasionally even counsel directors of historical TV series as part of their daily professional chores. They are often required to carefully monitor the use of historical arguments and references to the public realm by political actors, media, civil society, and others, and where necessary to correct them. In short, historians today are routinely applying both diachronic as well as synchronic approaches to their work, often in tandem. These developments in the historical profession provide, provide for an interesting reverse parallel to the field of study of international law, which has recently experienced a historiographic turn. Nowadays, and in stark contrast to the past, the development of international law is no longer perceived as an endogenous and teleological legal process of a success story pointing towards a brighter future for mankind. Rather, the development of modern international law seems more attuned to a thorny meandering path, the red thread of whom has been critically shaped by conflict, aggression, intervention, secession, war, occupation, ethnic cleansing, genocide, and other crimes against humanity. Accordingly, modern international law can be described by the metaphor of a storage medium of conflict memory. In the following, I wish to provide an initial and general sketch of how the history of Eastern Europe has shaped modern international law as we know it today. Thereby, I use the concept of Eastern Europe as a historical mesoregion in the sense of the German term Osteuropa, that is Russia, Soviet Union, East Central Europe, Northeastern Europe, and Southeastern Europe, respectively the Balkans. While a full and comprehensive survey of Eastern Europe's imp impact is far beyond the scope of my presentation, I wish nevertheless to highlight the primordiality of the Eastern European experience to modern international laws, historical unfolding. Looking to the origins of human rights law in the late 19th and early 20th century, a special place in my presentation shall be de dedicated to the development of minority rights. So this so distinctly associate, associated with the legal workings of Eastern Europe and its jurists, probably more so than per any other world region. 
Accordingly, I start with two general observations, Eastern Europe versus Western Europe and the role of memory in history. During the early modern period, the two halves of Europe, West and East, developed in very different directions. In the West, states like Portugal, Spain, France, Netherlands, and Britain grew rich due to their colonial empires and at the same time adopted an increasingly national character. In Europe's East, territorial warfare with its human losses and devastations was far more endemic than in the West, with the ensuing result of the decline of great powers, such as Sweden, Finland, Poland, Lithuania, and the Ottoman Empire, a process which was coupled with the rise of new great powers as Muscovite Russia, Brandenburg Prussia, respectively, later on Germany. Subsequently, in the 19th century, Eastern Europe then witnessed the region-wide triumph of nationalism and national movements. This in turn triggered the emergence of a dozen of small and medium-sized nation states spread as it were on the territory hitherto maintained by the former multi-ethnic empires of Habsburgs and Ottomans, a process which lasted up to the end of the 20th century and arguably even into the beginning of the 21st. This turbulent epoch in the history of Eastern Europe coincided almost entirely with the development of modern international law. It is thus not surprising that the latter was so heavily shaped by Eastern Europe's tumultuous path from, say, the partitions of Poland at the end of the 18th century to the proclamation of the Republic of Kosovo in 2008. In Western, Southern and Northern Europe, in the almost two centuries since 1830, in addition to the already existing states, altogether seven new states were founded. In contrast, in Eastern Europe, this number of newly formed states was almost four times higher, namely 25. The same phenomenon can be observed with regard to the number of international congresses held by the European Pentarchy between the Congress of Vienna of 1815 and the outbreak of World War I in 1914. Out of 27 international congresses in total, more than half were devoted to Eastern Europe alone. All through this period, the main target of European international humanitarian interventions was, of course, the Ottoman Empire with its still large territories in the Balkans. In other words, during the 19th century, the very formation period of modern international law, International action was predominantly geared towards Europe's east, resulting in the significant imprint of this region on modern international law. Notwithstanding the fact that Europe's eastern half formed an unequivocal, unequivocal part of the geographical region of Europe, according to Arnulf becker lauka it was nevertheless, in quotation marks, non-Western and semi-peripheral, as were Latin America, China, Japan, and other parts of the world. Correspondingly, Becker-Lorca's perception of modern international law was one of a mixture of European and, no and non-Western elements, for which the non-Western elements he duly coined the term mestizo international law. The second general observation draws from Jean Carbonnier's article on the Code Civil in the second volume of Pierre Nora's famous collections, Les Lieux des Mémoires. In this study, Carbonnier stresses the responsibility of law for memory as he defines customary law as a manifestation of collective memory. Other authors label, for example, the Peace of Westphalia of 1648 as 
a realm of memory of European dimension. And without second thoughts, and some authors without second thoughts call courtroom number 600 in the Palace of Justice at Nuremberg, where, between, where in 1945 and 46, the International Military Tribunal tried the political and military elite of Nazi Germany. They called this room a first-rate lieu de mémoire in Nora's sense of this term. Tellingly, nowadays, a part of this museum in Nuremberg is called Memorium Nuremberg Trials. And it is probably not entirely coincidental that Henri Dunant's book that triggered both the founding of the International Committee of the Red Cross and the signing of the first Geneva Convention for the amelioration of the condition of the wounded in armies in the field was entitled Un Souvenir de Solferino, a memory of Solferino. Dunant's description of the misery of the wounded on that battlefield in northern Italy, who did not receive medical attention and were left to die out in their, wo in their wounds, might be compared in the metho metaphorical sense to a tiny insect in a gem of amber. In its historical dimension, it is a minutely small event, yet one which back in its time caused a major innovation in international law. As with the fly, so with this treaty, it is inscribed into the subsequent unfolding of this innovation, today's ICRC, yet by now it is hardly recognizable and can only be observed when backlit by historical scholarship of modern international law's diachronic development. The next section of my presentation is entitled Eastern Europe and the Origins of Human Rights Law, 1917 and its consequences. A particularly prominent example for the impact of Eastern Europe's conflict history on modern international law can be observed in the famous Wilsonian moment. Following the weakening of Tsarist Russia in World War I, the right of peoples to their own self-determination was propagated by a variety of different political actors from the US President Woodrow Wilson all the way to the leader of the Russian Bolsheviks, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Almost simultaneously to its proclamation, this new doctrine was put in force first in Eastern Europe when Finland split off from Russia and gained its independence in this year, 1917. In 1918 then, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Ukraine, Georgia, and Armenia followed suit. At the world's other end, the hopes of the anti-colonial movements in Asia and Africa were in turn bitterly disappointed. In addition to the propagation of self-determination in Eastern Europe, the Bolshevik coup d'etat of 1917 also had a number of other uh, consequences for international law. The first was the huge wave of refugees from Russia to Central and Western Europe, which brought Fridtjof Nansen, the High Commissioner for Refugees of the New League of Nations, to issue in 1922 a new type of ID card for Persons d'origine russe, labeled Passport, Passport Nansen, Certificat d'identité et de voyage. Soon, this new identification document for stateless people was also issued to refugees from the now disintegr disintegrated Ottoman Empire. A second consequence of 1917 was the rise of the new Soviet Russia. From, 1922, from 1922 onwards, the Soviet Union, um, which developed its own, in quotation marks, revol revolutionary perception of international law. This perception was based on the assumption that there were three so-called circles of international law, a socialist international law, 
a bourgeois international law and an intersystemic international law, the latter to be applied in situations of contact, overlap, or friction between the socialist and the bourgeois ones. With the emergence of a socialist community after World War II, socialist international law was applied also in the relationship between the Moscow Center and the East Central and Southeast European peripheries, respective satellite states. In this context, in this context, the socialist international law now implied a limitation of the sovereignty of socialist states due to the mandatory concept of a proletarian internationalism, which was imposed by force by the Soviet Union. What in the context of the invasion of Czechoslovakia by Soviet and other Warsaw Pact troops in 1968 was termed the Brezhnev Doctrine, was firstly tested during the upheavals in the GDR in 1953 and in Hungary in 1956. Only during the late Perestroika period under Gorbachev and mainly due to Soviet military overstretch was this doctrine given up. In the fall of 1989, a Soviet di diplomat proclaimed a new doctrine, and I quote him, the Brezhnev doctrine is dead. You know the Frank Sinatra song, My Way. Hungary and Poland are doing it their way. We now have the Sinatra doctrine, unquote. In the new Russian Federation, the short-lived Sinatra doctrine of the late Soviet period was re placed by a concept labeled the near abroad, paraphrasing Karl Schmidt's formula of an Interventionsverbot für raumfremde Mächte, a prohibition of intervention by powers outside of one's own sphere of influence, um, uh, paraphrasing, paraphrasing Karl Schmidt's formula, Russia now imposed its own right of interventions as in Georgia in 2008 and in Ukraine in 2014. Its non-withdrawal of formerly Soviet, now Russian troops from the... ...doctrine never really died in the first place. It only altered its, its pattern of justification in the direction of what can, could be called a Putin doctrine. Back in 1919, Eastern Europe might have given birth to ideas of minority protection and people's right to self-determination. A century later, in the name of the protection of Russian-speaking and or pro-Moscow minorities in South Ossetia, Abkhazia, Crimea, the Dniester Valley, and Eastern Ukraine. Tsarist Russia's reawakened Geist, now in the shape of Putin's Russia, could dress its geostrategic interests with an international legal argument, argumentative garb, which originally stemmed from this region 100 years earlier. My next topic is Eastern Europe as a legal amplifier. In addition to the genuine innovations in international law, which were born as a response to Eastern Europe's conflicts, this historical geographic mesoregion also functioned as an amplifier for international legal concepts, which originated in other parts of the world, yet which came to be applied within this area. A striking example is the principle of uti posiditis. As the Swiss historian Jörg Fisch has observed, this traveling concept, quote, was developed in the context of the independence of the Ibero-American states and taken over in the 20th century, first of all in the decolonization of Africa and the dissolution of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. End of quotation. Briefly put, uti posidetis, which is Latin for as you possess, implies the application of territorial attrib attribution and sovereign title 
to the long-standing possessors of a territory and the demarcation of territorial boundaries according to the retrospective frontiers of previously recognized boundaries. In this sense, one could certainly add Czechoslovakia to Fisch's list, given the 1992 experience of the Velvet Divorce, that is the drawing of the new Czech-Slovak border according to the principle of uti positivis. Nevertheless, a mere return to older and seemingly universally recognized borders does not in and of itself ensure a frictionless international evolvement. In the case of Yugoslavia's breakup into its respective independent states, the strict adoption of uti positetis by the Badon Ter Arbitration Committee in 1992 and the ensuing rec recognition of its drawn borders by the European community for the boundaries of the six of the former Yugoslav republics, albeit not for the two autonomous provinces of Vojvodina and Kosovo. Um, this considerably exacerbated ex the ongoing Serb-Albanian conflict in the former socialist autonomous province of Kosovo. Conversely, and notwithstanding the fact that the Kosovo case was internationally declared to be sui generis, the recognition of the Republic of Kosovo in 2008 by most EU member states and other countries has considerably eroded the international validity of the uti positivis rule. Yet, on the other hand, it has fostered the right to self-determination. Here then, a spin in the reverse direction can be observed. The term Balkanization, which was coined in the, way, in the wake of the retreat of the Ottoman Empire from Southeastern Europe, and which also embodied the emergence of small Christian nation states there, had become from the 1960s onwards a popular meta metaphor for analysis of the outcomes of the decolonization process in Africa. I come now to the prosopographic dimension, jurists from minorities in the protection of minorities. The East European dimension in the shaping of modern international law becomes particularly obvious with regard to some of its prominent protagonists. East European jurists, such, such as Herr Schlauterpacht or Raphael Lemkin, hold the copyright for concepts of crimes against humanity and genocide. Both were born in Tsarist Russia's Pale of Settlement. Both received their education at the Austrian and then Polish University of Lemberg, respectively Polish Luf, to the Lviv in Ukraine. The international lawyer Philip Sens, author of the recent bestseller, East-West Street, on the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity, has labeled the East Galician capital, the Mecca of modern international law. Lo and behold, many other theoreticians and practitioners of international law indeed stemmed from Eastern Europe, predominantly from Tsarist Russia. This goes not only for Friedrich Martens, the convener of the 1899 to 1907 Hague Conventions, but also for others like Leonid Kamarovsky, Paul Vinogradov, Leo Motzkin, Paul Schiemann, Andre Mandelstam, Jacob, Jacob Robinson, and others. Born as Austro Hungarian Eastern Europeans were Egon Schwelb, Ludwig Ehrlich. Louis Sohn, Louis Henkin, Rudolf Laun, Hans Kelsen, and Erne Flachbart, to name just a few, that many of them were Jews and Zionists is no coincidence. Contemporary anti-Semitism and Russian pogroms were a strong motivation for these jurists to embrace the career, the career path of an international lawyer. The same goes for the fact that they experienced the inversion of their status 
from being formerly an imperial minority within the Romanov and Habsburg empires to the status of a national minority in one of the newly established Eastern European nation states. Dominated within these new states by a titular nation, which more often than not strove for ethno-national homogeneity, these lawyers found themselves, themselves continuously combatant in favor of their and others' minorities' rights. This at the same time explains why many of them, of these Jew, uh, Jewish um, uh, jurists, why many of them, like their Baltic German or Bohemian German colleagues, focus their research and practice upon topics associated with minority protection, with human rights and group rights. Up to 1933, Jewish and German jurists from the new states in East Central Europe even cooperated with each other within the framework of the Congress of European Nationalities. Most of Jewish Holocaust surviving jurists did, however, not stay, nor did they return to their East European regions of origins. Overwhelmingly, they either pursued careers in their countries of exile, such as Israel, the UK and the US, or for the more prominent of them, joined the evolving world of international organizations, such as the new United Nations. Nevertheless, to all their new places of refuge, these jurists carried forth their theoretical legal baggage and substan substantive experience from Lemberg, Vilna, Prague, and Warsaw. In addition to to the former Habsburg and Russian realms, the post-Ottoman Balkans also generated a disproportionately high number of leading international experts. Greeks such as Stefanos Etienne Kar Kara Theodori, Nikolaos Sar Sar Saripolos, and the Hellenized Bavarian Georgios Streit were particularly engaged with the Eastern question the unfolding of the now defunct Ottoman Empire. The next generation of Balkan jurists who followed suit, which include Antoine Frangoulis and Nikolaos Politis, gained prominence in the League of Nations. In the new post-World War I Yugoslavia, Slobodan Jovanovic, an early critic of Kelsen, Milovan Milovanovic and Juraj Ondrashi gained international reputation. Bulgaria's Nisim Mevorach, a Sephardic Jew and long-standing communist who drafted substantial parts of the fourth Geneva Convention relative to the protection of civilian persons in time of war. And the Romanian Vespasian Pella, who untiringly in endeavored for an international criminal court would be two of the Balkan jurists to impact the international legal scene post-World War II. Back during the interwar period, Pella was one of the driving forces behind the idea of a League of Nations Convention Against International Terrorism. The backdrop to this was a truly Balkan one. In 1934, two terrorist underground organizations the in internal Macedonian revolutionary organization and the Ustasha Croatian revolutionary movement teamed up to assassinate the Yugoslav king, Alexander Karadjordjevic. They did so successfully and on the occasion also killed the French foreign minister, Louis Bartou. Pella's definition of terrorism in the 1937 draft Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of Terrorism was subsequently adopted by the United Nations during the 1980s. In Article, Article 1.2 of Pella's proposed text from 1937, he defined international terrorism as, quote, all criminal acts directed against a state and intended or calculate, calculated to create a state of terror in the minds of particular persons 
or a group of persons or the general public, unquote. The origins of Pella's focus on fighting terrorism could be found in 1920, in Bulgaria of the 1920s, where another national revolutionary formation strove for a re revision of the Versailles system, the International Dobrugian Revolutionary Organization, which operated and carried its assaults cross-border from to Bulgaria, from Bulgaria to Rumi Romania, where Pella then lived. Even before the 1934 murders in Marseille, Pella had already established contacts with Raphael Lemkin in the latter's campaign in the League of Nations in favor of an international criminal court, a demand which Pella outlined in his book La Criminalité Collective, Des Etats et les Droits Pénal de l'Avenir of 1925. To Pella, the punishment of irredentism and revisionism did not go far enough. Political, propagandistic, and material support for terrorist underground movements also merited criminal, criminalization and punishment in his eyes. I come now to a significant paradigm shift from expulsion and populations from expulsion and populations exchange to minorities protection. Arguably, in no area of international law was the, in no other area of international law was the impact of Eastern Europe and the Balkans as prominent for world affairs as in the paradigm shift, which events this region trigger, triggered concerning what once was known as population exchange or the unmixing of peoples. Considered a sustainable solution to inter-ethnic tensions and ethno-political warfare, the forced population exchange, exchange executed under the League of Nations auspices pursuant to the terms of the Lausanne Convention concerning the exchange of Greek and Turkish populations of 1923 quickly became the international legal go-to solution for the resolution of problems concerning ethno-religious minorities within a majoritarian nation state. Back in 1923, the Lausanne Accord provided an international legal sanctioning for the forced displacement of some 1.8 million people. Seven decades later, in the Dayton Agreement for Peace in Bosnia and Herzegovina of 1995, forced migration had become both politically and legally banned by the international community. The 20th century, which began with the legalization of the uprooting of peoples in the Balkans, ended with the securement of their right to return as expellees and refugees and obliged the domestic authorities to guarantee the safety of the returnees. This landslide change in international legal thinking becomes evident when one compares the two core paragraphs of both treaties. Again, two, two quotations. First, as from the 1st May 1923, there shall take place a compulsory exchange of Turkish nationals, nationals of the Greek Orthodox religion established in Turkish territory and of Greek nationals of the Muslim religion established in Greek territory. And second, Dayton, all refugees and displaced persons have the right freely to return to their homes of origin, end of quotation. In other words, coerced uprooting as enforced by state actors, which in 1923 had been considered both politically correct and perfectly legal, had in 1995 acquired the moral status of ethnic cleansing and the international legal status of a war crime, a crime against humanity, and with regard to the massacre of 8,000 Bosnian men and boys by Bosn Bosnian Serbs near Srebrenica of genocide. Not only were the perpetrators tried, 
the expelled were now granted the right of safe return. Soon after the expulsions of some 900,000 Albanians from Kosovo into the neighboring countries by regular and irregular Serbian armed forces in 1999, even triggered a forced international military intervention on behalf of the expellees, thus enabling their swift return. Thomas Frank, a prominent international lawyer, has labeled NATO's airstrike operation Allied Force against Romp Yugoslavia, and I quote him, technically illegal, but morally legitimate. And even for his reluctant colleague Antonio Cassese, um, uh, Cassese who, who um, uh, coined the phrase that under certain con conditions, ex injuria jus oritur, from injustice, justice emerges. The question remains, however, what transpired internationally in between 1923 and the second half of the 90s, which would have brought about this 180 degree round the house cut. Already in December 1922, shortly before the Lausanne Convention entered into, the for into force, the British Foreign Minister Lord Curzon had spoken of the idea of forced population exchange as recently propagated in Lausanne as a, quote, thoroughly bad and vicious solution for which the world would pay a heavy penalty for a hundred years to come, unquote. Still, however, population exchange, be it based either on a formal treaty a la Lausanne or more tacitly sanctioned by the international community, as in the case of the forced migrations immediately after World War II, was legitimately considered by the international community as a meaningful measure of defusing ethno-political conflict. The decisions of the Big Three in 1945 at the Potsdam Conference with regard to the expulsion of some 12 million Germans from East Central Europe, the case of Slovenes and Croats in Trieste, and the 15 million Hindu-Muslim exchange between Pakistan and India in 1947, all these merely confirm this trend. To many jurists, including the current president of the OSC, of OSC's Court of Conciliation, Christian Tomushat, even the events in Cyprus as late as 1974, also amounted to what he called an exchange of population. And the 1948 UN General Assembly Re Resolution um, 195 on Palestine, which provided that refugees wishing to return to their homes and live at peace with their neighbors should be permitted to do so at the earliest practical date. This was at best hortatory and did not contain the phrase right of return. Correspondingly, it had no consequences, not the least thanks to the del deliberate number of legal loopholes for the governmental actors involved. Lest one think that the international sanctioning of expulsion ended in 1974 in Cyprus, hardly any international protest took place when as late as 1989, the communist regime in Bulgaria, just a few months before its collapse, in the wake of a state-sponsored emigration hysteria, is expelled some 370,000 of its own Turkish-speaking citizens of Muslim faith into neighboring Turkey in what would seem as a massive violation of human rights and most probably also a crime against humanity. The US Department of State and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation were virtually the only ones raising their voices in protest. And yet, merely six years after these events on the Turkish-Bulgarian border, an international paradigm shift seemed to have materialized in Bosnia and another four years later in Kosovo. 
One possible answer as to the reasons behind this radical paradigm change between Lausanne and Dayton might have to do with the nexus between human rights and realpolitik. These, of course, are not always interlocking. Nevertheless, the fact that the bipolar world of the Cold War was very different from the multipolar one of the 1990s, and that due to technological progress, the impact of audiovisual media on policymakers, the pictures from the concentration camps at Kerater and Omarska, run by Bosnian forces, surfaced around the world in no time. These issues might well have to do with this paradigm shift. Um, let me also have a short look at some Balkan perspectives on international humanitarian law. To a historian of the Balkans, what happened in 1998 and 1999 in Kosovo is not an entirely unknown scenario. The Kosovo Liberation Army, the Kosovo Liberation Army's fight for independence from Belgrade quite obviously followed a conflict pattern developed by Greek and Macedonian insurgents against the Ottoman Empire during the 19th and early 20th century. In this pattern, one can identify five, six pages. Number one, the emergence of a regional conflict of an asymmetric nature yeah. whose ideological bedrock lies in differences in ethnopolitical ethno backgrounds. Step two, an appeal for help to the international public by the weaker part of the conflict. Step three, an overreaction by the stronger party to the conflict in the form of massacres, ethnic cleansing, or even genocide. This reaction being invariably due to provocations by the weaker part who supplies international media with harrowing reports and pictures. Step four, outrage by world public opinion and an increasing pressure on national and international political actors to intervene. Step five, intervention by national or international actors on behalf of the weaker side, with the result of a military solution, defeat, ceasefire, armistice, followed by a political solution, autonomy, pro protectorate, suzerainty, independence, and others. And finally, stage six, in the medium or long term, a change of norms of international law through the abolishment of previous norms and the adoption, adoption of new ones. The Kosovo War of 1999 and the earlier, Yugos, earlier wars for Yugoslav secession from 91 to 95, together with the genocidal inter-ethnic conflict in Rwanda in 94, triggered what Marty Koskinemi has termed the turn to ethics in international law. The adoption of the international principle of the responsibility to protect, the establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in 93, the tribunal in Rwanda in 94, and finally, um, uh, in 1998, the adoption of the Rome Statute and the establishment of the International Criminal Court in 2002 all form part of this turn. Accordingly to Theodor Meron, the Holocaust surviving Polish-born president of the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, Meron has stated that, quote, international humanitarian law has developed faster since the beginning of the atrocities in the former Yugoslavia than in the four and a half and a half decades since the Nuremberg Tribunals and the adoption of the Geneva Conventions for the Protection of Victims of War of August 12, 1949." Unquote. A striking proof, proof of this assessment is the fact that, based explicitly on the Bosnian experience, rape and other forms of sexual violence in armed conflicts are nowadays also considered as war crimes, crimes against humanity, and even genocide. In looking through the 
conflict storage mediums. Our glass, an East Central Europe, um, an East Central European international legal um, legacy, thus can be identified with the body of today's modern international law becoming so vast and wide, one might be excused for forgetting altogether where everything started. The return to the metaphor at the beginning of this presentation of Eastern European experiences as the tiny insect around which initially the huge ember which has become today's international law began its development and which hardly can be seen today. This return probably merits a casual return to the point of departure. For example, the European Commission on the Danube, a result of the Crimean War and in existence from 1856 to 1940, was a blueprint for a number of international organizations founded in later decades. And in 1930, the Permanent Court of International Justice in The Hague came to provide for the first time the very definition of what it considered to be a legitimate minority in its advisory opinion in the, in the Greco-Bulgarian communities case. Shortly after, that same court set the rules for states to grant national minorities not only to individuals to individual, but also to group rights in its 1935 advisory opinion on minority schools in Albania. To speak of minorities' rights, the essential bedrock of today's human rights law is to speak firstly of the Balkans. Similar path-breaking decisions in other branches of international law also stemmed from events in East Central Europe, the ICTY's judgment in the 1990, 1990 Tadic case, which established that the norms of international humanitarian law apply not only to armed conflicts between states, but also to the parties in an intrastate war, is one example, this time from the branch of international humanitarian law. The 1997 decision of the International Court of Justice in the Gabčikovo Natimaroč case concerning Hungary's refusal to stick to a 1977 treaty with Czechoslovakia on a dam across the Danube, where the court clearly stressed that the principle of clausula rebus sixtantibus applies even after Hungary's regime change and the velvet divorce of Slovakia from the Czech Republic. And this notwithstanding the negative effects on the economy and the eco ecology is another example, this time concerning international procedural law. Of course, not all in innovations originating, originating in Eastern Europe were of lasting effects. This goes, for example, for the temporary establishment of free cities invented at the Congress of Vienna in 1815 and applied to the West Galician capital of Krakow, revitalized at the Paris Peace Conference of 1919-20 for Danzig and buried in Osimo in 1975 when Italy and Yugoslavia sanctioned the 1954 division among themselves of the free territory of Trieste provided for in 1947. To come back at the end to the metaphoric comparison of the provisions of international law with a storage medium of conflict memory, returning to the amber gem enclosing a bug or a fly. In looking at this tiny insect through the magnifying glass, we often have difficulties to even find out to which species it, it belongs, let alone determine the exact place on earth where it had fallen into the fossil resin in the first case. In the case of the history of international law, more often than not, this place was somewhere in Europe's other lung in the East.
in so far, even a statement by Russian President Putin at the festive session on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the International Court of Justice, ICJ, in the Peace Palace of The Hague on 22nd November 2005, contains more than a grain of truth, and I quote him somewhat reluctantly, this innovative idea of establishing a permanent international court was born in our country, and it was self-denyingly propagated by progressive representatives of the Russian legal science." Unquote. However, the fact that in April of 2017, the same ICJ as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, found by 13 votes to three, again a quotation, that Russia must refrain from imposing limitations on the ability of the Crimean Tatar community to conserve its representative institutions, including the Mechlis, and ensure the, ensure the availability of education in the Ukrainian language." Unquote. This fact was ignored by the Russian occupation authorities on the Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea, as well as by the president of the Russian Federation, remains the structural problem that in contrast to national law, in international law only seldomly can be enforced. Thank you very much for your attention.